let's talk a little bit about forces. Here we have a block on this track. It's not moving. It's not going to move. So it is in static equilibrium. Static meaning it's not moving. Equilibrium meaning that there are no net forces acting upon that block. Now keep in mind, no net forces is not the same as no forces. There's clearly a gravitational force acting on the block. And there's also a normal force due to the track acting on the block. At this point, I've attached a string to the block. And so the string is exerting a force, a tension force. And you'll see the block is still not moving. It's not going to move. And so there must be an opposing force. That would be a force due to friction also acting on the block. Also over here on the right-hand side, you'll see there's a hanging mass. And that mass has a gravitational force down as well as a tension force from the same string pulling up. It's also not moving, and so those forces must also balance so that you have a net force of zero. And so both of these objects are in static equilibrium. Now if I attach a larger mass over the edge, it still isn't moving. If I give it a little push, you will see that it moves to the right-hand side. Okay, so it was undergoing a force, so it was moving. There was a net force acting on it, and there was an acceleration. Might not have been a large acceleration, but there was a little bit of an acceleration. You'll notice again it isn't moving, but when I gave it a push, it did begin to move. And what that's telling us is that there's two different kinds of friction here. There's static friction, which is strong can be strong. And then there's kinetic friction, which is happening when it's sliding, and that's a weaker frictional force. And so the stronger static frictional force is keeping it from moving. Now I have a larger mass hanging over the edge. And if I let go, you'll see that it does, in fact, slide. And so the static frictional force is incapable of stopping the tension from pulling the block. So the tension is larger because a larger mass is hanging over the edge. And so if I look at this system, there is an acceleration to the right of the block, an acceleration down for the mass. Because there was an acceleration and the two objects are connected by a single string going around just one pulley, that indicates then that the acceleration of the wooden block must be the same as the acceleration of the hanging mass. The same in magnitude. Direction's a whole different story. The mass is accelerating in the negative y direction. The block is accelerating in the positive x direction. But the magnitudes of those two accelerations are the same. Now, I should point out, friction is a very interesting force. We have to be very careful about what the direction of friction is. If there is sliding or intended sliding, the frictional force will always oppose that sliding. Now, a good example of where that might be important and not nearly as obvious is if I push this block backwards. So if I push it to the left, you can see that it continues to move after my hand stops. So watch again and watch my hand. My hand will stop, but the block will continue to move to the left. Now, during that left-hand movement, the block is moving to the left. The frictional force is, in fact, to the right. But as soon as the block reverses direction, the frictional force is going to be to the left because the block is moving to the right. So be very careful about what direction the frictional force might be acting. All right, we now have a system with an inclined plane. Down at this end, we have a green cart. And behind that green cart, you'll see a motion sensor right on the edge of the screen, I think. And then over on the right-hand side, we have a hanging mass. At this point, it's 200 grams. And the cart, you can see, is not moving with that mass of 200 grams. But we're going to run an experiment. I'm going to place 400 grams over on this side. And the cart will accelerate up the incline. The motion sensor will measure the position and velocity of the cart. And then attached to the cart, we have a force sensor. And the force sensor will measure the tension in the string. So let's run that experiment. Let's see what happens. Okay, you can see the 400 gram mass is hanging. I'm going to start my collection. And you saw the data being collected. 
So here's the data that goes along with the experiment we were just performing. Take a look at this portion of the force. We can see that that sits at around 4 newtons. Now that really makes sense when you think about the fact there were 400 grams hanging from the end. Now this is the point where I was still holding on to the cart. So if I take 0.4 kilograms, that's 400 grams, and I multiply that by 9.8 meters per second squared, I'm going to get something around 4 newtons. At this point right in here is where I let go. And so we can see then that here is the forces, the tension in the string as it's falling. So here at the two second mark, something unusual is going on, and that's probably when the mass hit the floor or I grabbed the cart. So we're just going to concentrate on this bit of data in here. I'm interested in what that force is, shaking up and down, but that's just collection error. But what we can do is we can find the mean for that set of data. So I click on the statistics button here, and it tells me that the mean is 3.8, and the median is also about 3.8. So that's the tension, 3.8 newtons. So let's go ahead and record that. So the tension equals 3.8 newtons. The other thing I'm interested in is the acceleration. And I can get the acceleration from the position graph and from the velocity graph, so either of these two. Now if it's a uniform acceleration, the position should be going as t squared. And indeed, if you look at this curve here, it does look a lot like a parabola. Notice over here it's pretty much a straight line, but that's because I had not yet let go. So if I do a curve fit on this same bit of data here on the position graph, I can go up here to curve fit. This should be a parabola, so the at squared is already highlighted. It gives a guess of 1 and 1 and 1 for a, b, and c. And so I'm going to try and fit. And you can see the coefficient here of a is 0 0.1583. Now, the coefficient a is what's in front of the t squared. Now, that should be 1 half the acceleration. So 0 0.1583 is 1 half the acceleration. So acceleration divided by 2 equals 0 0.1583. Now that means then that the acceleration is twice that, and that would be 0 0.3166. And that's in meters per second squared. And I can verify that by taking a look at the velocity graph. The velocity graph, which I think I can make this better, let me reduce the minimum to 0. That's when it's not moving at all and the maximum to about 1. And you can see in here, I've pretty much got a straight line. Right about in this point, something's happening. Not quite sure what it is, so I'm kind of going to ignore that. Probably a bump in the data someplace. But if I take a look at a curve fit for that function, that should be linear, so that's going to be a straight line, which you see right here. And if I try a fit, you'll see the slope of that line which is acceleration, the slope of the velocity versus time graph should be acceleration, is 0 0.3247. So according to the line, A is equal to 0 0.3247. And again, that's meters per second squared. So you can see that those accelerations are in pretty good agreement. I might average the two of them to find out what my experimental acceleration would be. And then I have a tension of 3.8 newtons, and I can look at that as my experimental tension and compare that with my actual theoretical values that I would get by solving the equations from an earlier film.